Turn in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel again. And chapter 8, I this afternoon finished up my outline on chapter 8. At least it's finished to this point. A lot of times when I go over what I'm going to actually be preaching, then I interject more into it. But uh, at least um, the outlining of it uh, to this point is, is finished, and I'll be getting to look at chapter 9 again. But we have presently in the last couple of weeks looked at verses 8 and 9. Uh, so let's, uh, let's begin reading with verse 7, and we'll read 7, 8, and 9. And then tonight we'll begin looking at verse 10. And so we'll read verse 10 as well. It said, And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall, then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold a door. <laughs> in other words, not a surprise to him. I mean, he dug till he had a big enough hole to call it a door that he could go through. And he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. And if you remember the last couple of lessons were basically on the fact that God knows, he sees. He knows our wickedness. He knows our sin. His message Sunday morning was on temptation. He knows when we're tempted. He knows when we give in to that temptation. And seeing as he knows... <laughs> He's going to reveal it to Ezekiel. That's the whole purpose in, in this vision. That's the whole purpose in, in taking him in a vision. Whether you want to call it a dream, whatever. To Jerusalem, to the temple. And so he said, behold the wicked abominations that they do. Go in and behold. See, look at those wicked abominations that they do. Verse 10. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping thing and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. He sees all their idolatries. Every, every image, every idol that they worshipped was engraved on this wall, was pictured on this wall. Wow. Every form of creeping thing. Beast. Not only clean, but unclean as well. Every creeping thing and beast, clean and unclean. Were pictured on this wall. They had made these things abominable by worshiping them. But no, I want to stress the fact. It was unclean as well as clean. I, I, I guess you and I would have to be an Israelite, be a Jew, 
to really understand the implications of that. I mean, we, we, and it's not too hard because we go, we go into the New Testament and we see the scribes and the Pharisees and, and we see the, 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 the 12 apostles. I mean, Peter. I mean, he had a problem getting, getting over that unclean bit, didn't he? He had a problem with going to, would have had a problem going to Cornelius if the Lord hadn't given him a vision during the night. In all manner, clean and unclean, coming down yeah. forth. And he said, Arise, kill, and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord, for nothing unclean has entered my mouth. You see? And based upon that, we might even say here in Ezekiel's day that, that they weren't probably weren't eating that which was unclean. But they were worshiping it. It didn't matter to them. Well, we're not eating that. We can go ahead and worship it. Right? Uh, if you're giving me a little bit of indulgence here, We're there. I mean, people today, they have more love and more care for their dogs, their cat, than they do for human life. And Primarily, a thought about the human life and what I have reference to are going to be coming out in the course of these studies the next few weeks. Think about these idols. All of them were. Insentient. Turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4. And, and look with me here at verse uh, 28. Lord said that that he was going to if they were disobedient and they did not the commands of the Lord and uh, uh, that he would put a cursing upon them and, and, and that he would scatter them among the nations and look at verse 28 it says and there ye shall serve gods the work of men's hands wood and stone which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. In other words, they have no feeling. They, they do not have the senses that we have. Now, I understand that some of those beasts have a, a keener sense of sight than, than we do. They have a keener sense of smell than we do. But they lack the power of, of reasoning. Not only are they insensitive, they, they are perishable. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah in, in chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 and we read here in verse 20 he that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation 
chooseth a tree that will not rot. Just give you a little explanation on this. Do you know of any tree that will not rot? So what is he talking about here? A tree chooses a tree that will not rot. Sycamore tree that's pretty good. Yeah, he's talking about one. He's talking about one that is 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 durable, and we know that to be true. There there are some trees that are more durable, and, and, and even to the point they say they're almost fire uh, resistant. They're they're resistant to fire. They're risk resistant to decay. Doesn't mean they can't burn. Doesn't mean they can't decay. Won't decay. But they're they're some of the most durable known to man. That's what he's talking about here. He goes and, and, and chooses something which is, is sturdy and hard and, and, and durable, something that's going to stand, uh, stand the test of time. You see, I guess we would liken it to maybe the redwoods in California, which, by the way, they're not millions of years old. <laughs> we was looking. Uh, we heard a thing on the redwoods in California the other night. This fellow was talking about them. Uh, this little tree right here is, is what a million years old, probably. This little thing right here, he said. So these big things here, are hundreds of millions of years old. Well, we know that's not so. We know that God created the heavens and the earth, and it was only about 6,000 years ago that he did that. And to blow their minds, they, he created the adult trees, all ready to go. <laughs> ah, well, what happened after the flood? Were those redwoods destroyed? <coughs> Most likely. Well, the same creator could bring forth life, adult life again, could he not? You see? Well, that's not the lesson. But continue reading our verse, verse 20. So he chooses a wood that is, is, is durable. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Do, do you get the gist here? He goes and finds a wood that is durable, that had a creator, and then he goes and finds a workman that is, is, is cunning in the art of crafting to make that piece of wood into that which he wants it made into. And he's going to worship this piece of wood who had a creator and had another creator to craft it into the image that the fellow wanted it created in. And then worship it. As though it was something. Well surely we see the foolish that and foolishness in that, don't we? <laughs> Not only are they insensitive and, and perishable, they are helpless and cannot save. Wouldn't you think that that would be one of the, the characteristic traits of, of a God? That he could save you? That he could deliver you out of trouble? Turn with me to the 45th chapter of Isaiah. 
in verse 20. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations, they have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. I take and carve images in this piece of wood here and then I worship it and I pray to it and it cannot save. It's helpless to do anything. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. Chapter 10. This is not the only time we'll be coming to Jeremiah chapter 10. But look at verse 5. This tree that the workman took and cut down with an axe, it said right here in verse 5, they are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. <laughs> they must be carried about because they can't go. They must be placed here or placed there because they can't go on their own. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. <laughs> they, they can't do anything. And yet they're worshipped. See the helplessness and hopelessness of those dumb idols? These images of all sorts of creeping things and, and beasts, clean and unclean, that they had engraved in this wall. They had, they had made their, them their gods and, and they worshipped them. They had borrowed them from the Egyptians. They had borrowed them from the inhabitants of the land which they were to drive out from before them and were to destroy them. Turn with me to the book of Numbers in, in chapter 33. The book of Numbers in chapter 33. And look at verse 52. Then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures and destroy all their molten images and quite pluck down all their high places. Now these pictures, they were probably engraved images on a stone or on a slate like what Ezekiel graved in a brick. They called it a, a, a brick in, in Ezekiel, uh, which was a stone. It would have been like a soft stone, like a sandstone or something. But they engraved images in, in these, and they... The purpose of these engraven images, whether, whether it be of the sun, the moon, the stars, or of some beast or some human, was to worship them. Which the children of Israel were forbidden not to do in 
the book of Exodus in chapter 20 and the law being given to them. But was typical of the heathen, the people dwelling in the land in which they were going. And therefore, they were to utterly destroy them. They were to utterly destroy their pictures and their idols and everything. Which they failed to do. They failed to do. They didn't destroy all the people. And having not destroyed all the people, they didn't destroy all their pictures and all their idols. And they became partakers with them in their idolatry. Turn with me to the book of Romans in chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and look with me here verses 23 through 25. It says they, verse 22 says professing themselves to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. That is what they were guilty of. And that is what we are guilty of today. Thirty-five hundred years later, <laughs> and these things were written for our samples, that we might be admonished, that we might be instructed, not to do likewise. Turn with me, Psalms. 106. And look at verse 20. Psalms 106 and verse 20. Thus, by this idolatry, talking about back there at the foot of the mountain when Moses had gone up into the mountain and they made the molten calf, he said in verse 20, he said, Thus they changed their glory, their glory, into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. Their glory. Let me ask you something. What was their glory? Their glory was to be God. It was to be glory unto God. And God was to be their glory. They were to be a bright and shining light to all the nations round about. Where did they, where did they get the idea of a molten calf? Came out of Egypt. Came out of Egypt. They borrowed from the Egyptians. That was, they left and were to leave behind. They borrowed it from them. <laughs> and we would say, well, of course they had hundreds of years of being brought up under their pra that practice of the Egyptians. Look with me in verses 34. They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. Listen. Yeah. 
That's why they were to utterly destroy them. But they did not utterly destroy them. And they mingled about with them. That is, they became part of them. And they learned their evil works. Their wicked works. We have to live in this world. We have to work in this world. We have to make our living in this world. We have to associate in this world. We're commanded to preach the gospel to them, but we are not to mingle, and we are not to learn their works. We're to be separate. We're to be different. And they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. That is the works they learned. They learned to serve those idols. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. They learned to sacrifice their sons and their daughters unto devils. And shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. We are sacrificing our sons and our daughters unto idols. We're sacrificing our sons and our daughters unto, well, it's my body. I ought to be able to do with it what I want to do with it. We're sacrificing our sons and our daughters unto me. And the land, that's part of verse 38, was polluted with blood. And if the land of Israel was polluted with blood, what is our land polluted with? Thus were they defiled with their own works and went a whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. They were to be an inheritance unto the Lord. And they were so defiled with wickedness and sin of the people of the land that he abhorred them. Romans chapter 1, in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. All ungodliness. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. And <laughs> so we borrow likewise we borrow of the gods of this world which are helpless and so worthless I am so helpless and so worthless but every time I exalt myself and I want my way I'm worshiping that which is so helpless and so worthless, a God of this world, pride. Pride and arrogance. And we bring our abominable things into the house of the Lord. And as we're going to find out later on, the Lord has had his fill with sacrifices. He wants a heart rendered obedience and service to him and not the guise of vain worship not the guise of vain sacrifices he calls their sacrifices vain he calls their worship vain because it means nothing 
It's not unto him, it's unto themselves. And the gods which they have chosen to serve. And when we do likewise, we're no better than they. All right, we'll quit there this evening and take up to go on with the next point next week. Hey, we got through a whole verse tonight. We got through verse 10. I hope that you've been able to glean that which is profitable for us today in application. We've see, seen much about Israel and, and their behavior. But let's think about it in the light of where we're at today. Where our world, our world is still wicked. Our world is still full of idolatry today. Let us not be guilty of learning their ways and and, and borrowing from them and and making their works our works, which we know we so often are. Shall we stand? Be dismissed. Word of prayer.